I saw this Dr. Bronner's battle. <laughs> and I looked at it. And I started reading it. And it says a lot of stuff on there, but it says at one point, it says all one or none. And my mind just exploded and my soul shot out of my head at the speed of light and then expanded into the universe and I became one with the universe. And I, at that point, here's the Dr. Bronner's bottle, just so you see it. I, I basically, I, I became one with God, one with the universe. And I became uh, fucking enlightened. <laughs> I mean, we just started calling things Wham City to have kind of a like, to like, because we were like, there's these cool art collectives around. We could be like that. But like, it was a constantly shifting like group of people. It was just whoever was like working on stuff generally at the time. We'd throw that name on it. Like if you ask anyone who is in Wham City at any given time, you'd probably get a totally different list. A lot of times when I talk to my dad on the phone, he, he'll like list somebody and then be like, so are they a member of Wham City? And I'm just like, I don't, I don't know. Or I mean, sometimes I'm like, yes, because they moved here with that group and they went to purchase college. So yes, but the rest of the time I'm like, I don't know, it's a mystery. Like I collaborate with them closely, but I would never be like, I'm a member of Wham City. So I don't know. I had a uh, figure drawing class with Ben at SUNY Purchase and he was old, he was maybe two years older than me but we were in the same figure drawing class and uh, we just became friends and we would draw uh, naked people and make fun of them. And then uh, he started doing puppet, sh like a puppet show, a weird trippy puppet show with our friend Aaron Gleason called Show Beast and they moved to Oakland, California and started doing the puppet show there. I basically learned through that because it was just, no, there was no pressure and it didn't matter, it was just fun. And when I got there, Ben was already done with Oak Oakland and decided to move to Baltimore because that's where he had a lot of friends and that's where the Wham City people were starting to like put stuff together. They were doing cool stuff, so I decided to move here. And then, yeah, that's basically how I met the larger group and started working with them. Initially, the Wham City group was largely based around music. All of our friends are musicians and they're all touring all the time. And we just wanted to... We wanted to have that fun as well. We wanted to tour. I didn't know how to play any instruments, so I came up with a kind of character that could exist in the setting of like a kind of like a punk show or a DIY show. Which was, and the character was this guy, Blue Leader, who was essentially some kind of embodiment or some sort of elemental figure that represented like the history of video games. Our collective kind of always had this multidisciplinary attitude where it was like we all perform and we all do music and we all you know do video and we all we just all do whatever we want that's the kind of like punk rock you know attitude of like you don't have to know how to do it to do it you just do it and you figure it out it became wham city comedy it became its own entity apart from the larger wham city group and so where that where the tours used to be these big kind of like two hour giant variety show, video, music, like, ex like extravaganzas. Now they've kind of been boiled down. Now we do like 45 minute shows, hour long shows. So we were approaching it from this art perspective. When I see art students now who are doing humorous things or doing comedy things, it's always more, even if it's bad, I find it's more entertaining than a bar comic who's, you know, talking about not liking their wife or whatever it is. It's, you know, we have a, monthly comedy show which we use kind of to experiment and try stuff out stuff that isn't really polished stuff that we wrote hours before the show if you where is the super glue i have a something that needs to be glued uh i don't know i can't find it <laughs> and then we'll take that kind of thing that we try in front of a baltimore audience and uh put it in our bigger shows that we'll tour around and stuff the tour acts as this like creativity engine where we're constantly like coming up with new ideas developing new ideas and 
then it's like from those ideas, then when someone's like, what do you got for us? Like, what can you pitch or something like that? It's like, we have, we have more ideas than we know what to do with. You know, I had the, this weird skit that I wrote that like I did with a random audience member. Um, the skit wasn't funny. It wasn't like made to be funny. It was just a lot of weird dialogue followed up by me like putting rubber gloves on someone's hands and kissing them. <laughs> it's not gonna like get a lot of like people rolling in the aisles laughing. But the thing that made me realize that it was go going okay was that like the people that that the hands that I saw go up for the volunteer, when I asked for a volunteer, went up kind of quickly. So I was like, this is valuable enough to these people that they feel like they want to be a part of it. So that gives me some energy. I've done some pres fake presentations and performances as like kind of a, an idiot that doesn't know anything about what he's talking about. And, and using things like meditation and spirituality. Like the funny thing is, is that I'm actually really into that stuff. <laughs> like I actually really love like new age spirituality. And that's why I like to make fun of it, because I know it so well, and I know how silly it is. I don't know if you know this or not, but chickens have exactly the same DNA as humans. This is real. This is, be this is because they have the exact inverse evolutionary history, okay? Chickens are what we would be if we got all fucked up and covered in feathers, and we couldn't speak, and our noses got hard like glass. It makes sense that you spend all day looking at something or thinking about something, and you're gonna, if you're a comedian, you're going to want to, like, make a joke. <laughs> I just was always, I've always been interested in 3D graphics and computer stuff and I've, I don't know, I've always just watched making of features for movies with special effects and I think that a lot of it comes from that. But if you remember my simple phrase, save it to your desktop, you're not only going to have a wicked sweet awesome desktop, you're also going to have a wicked sweet awesome life. Alan actually knows a lot about like downloading your, like uploading yourself to the internet. Like he actually knows a lot about like scanning and stuff. <laughs> so there's this guy at Adult Swim named Dave Hughes. Anyways, he was a fan of Dan Deacon and he had started coming to our live shows, our comedy shows. And he had been talking to us for a while saying we should get an idea together to pitch. We came up with two pitches and we pitched a series and a like one-off special. And the series was denied and the special was accepted and that was Live Forever As You Are Now with Alan Resnick. And that was based off of a performance that he did on the tour. I was created to be an exact digital backup of Alan Resnick. My purpose is to replace Alan Resnick at the time of his death. Thank you. It was the most legitimate thing we'd ever done and it was the most we'd ever had to spend on a project. We were used to having doing these projects with no budget at all. So we had enough money to like hire people to light it and build a set and made it look like it was a TV show. I really like working on the internet presence because it's a cool like extension of just like the whole thing. Yeah, we just wanted to make like what we thought that stupid character he was playing, like what his website would be like, really just narcissistic but terrible. And Alan has long been obsessed with that thing where like a guy pops up from the bottom and it's like a terrible flash video and he introduces you to his website. So he was like, we have to have that. And there's some good Easter eggs in that too. There's the chat with Teddy thing, which was really fun to uh, program. And then like, if you say certain things to him, you can act, you get to this like video of Alan in the shower. <laughs> which is really funny that some people found. And then we did commencement speech for Adult Swim with Robbie, which is also based off of his performance on the tours. And I had done comedy pieces before that were kind of just sad, and it, it showed me as this kind of weak, manic character. And I was sick of, of always being that character, so I wanted to kind of turn that around and become something that was triumphant and something that had a lot of power. I really wanted to be able to actually frighten people by saying things very loudly that were almost, uh, almost improper. I will not stop until I desolate their heart so that they will curse the hour of their birth. That character was based on reading a lot about dictators in the 20th century like Pol Pot or Robert Mugabe or Hitler, obviously, and, and making a comedy piece out of that was, was really like, exciting to me. But anyways, that kind of opened the door for us to talk to them and give them more ideas. So we kept thinking about 4 a.m. and what, what it's like to watch TV at that time. Ben had an idea about a commercial that didn't 
end. And that's where the second uh, infomercial came, came from, the uh, unedited footage of a bear. I was in charge of finding a location for it. So, and that was interesting because I'd never really done anything like that before and we needed such a specific look. So for a long time, I spent a long part of last summer just like driving around the surrounding areas trying to find the creepiest suburbs possible. Um, you know, and sometimes Robbie or Alan would come with me, but we, we wound up finding one right here in Baltimore, which was cool. Cricket like, was able to kind of like work out a, a very good deal for how the shoot progressed through this neighborhood. And, and we made the fewest people unhappy, I think, that we could have made unhappy. The town didn't know what we were making, really. They thought we were making a commercial. And they were really excited for the first few days. We were shooting in this um, community, like this kind of suburban, kind of creepy community that hated us. We had to get this shot of this woman covered in blood in the middle of the street. And we meant to do it on a day where kids would be in school, but we couldn't. <laughs> so we had to do it on Sunday when they're all outside hanging out. And we had to get a wide shot, so it meant we had to like dress this woman up all gross and then all run away from her. It just looks like someone died in the street, basically. So we set it up, and we're like, let's go. And we like got the shots, we got the, and we're like looking around and people are starting to gather and cars are driving by and they're like, like freaked out. And we're like, uh, and we're just like getting, and we got the shot and we're like, all right, let's go. And then we like got everything up, we're like running away. And then this woman is just like screaming at us, just like, my kids saw that. And I felt, I honestly felt like bad about it. Like I thought that that was wrong. We shouldn't have done it. It was traumatizing. My favorite part for the last thing we did, the unedited footage of a bear, was that I made the website for um, clairedrill.com. It was like a fake allergy medicine website, and then we like dropped this, put this Easter egg thing where if you click on the house in the background, you get closer and closer, and then you get to go, go into this point and click game. And then like, the next morning, they, Alan woke me up and was like, everybody figured the whole thing out. They like buried the present in the yard. And like, I was like, what? I didn't think it was crazy. So that was really, really fun and made me want to do more stuff like that. With unedited footage of a bear, we were playing with context there where it was like, it was on a comedy network, so we were able to make something that has no jokes in it, really. The ideas often come from thinking about who's watching TV at, at night, who's, who's up at 4 a.m., and what would be an interesting thing for them to experience if they were half awake or high or falling asleep. I'm excited to see how far we can take comedy, especially broadcast comedy. Um, without making jokes. <laughs> I don't write good jokes. I don't want to write jokes. I always just want to write s stories that are kind of darker and that have like a drier sensibility. We've done two 11 minute specials. Now we want to do a series of them. Now we want to have something more stable. I think as a group, we want just the ability to make what we want, to be able to make a living off of doing the weird things we want to do. I feel like everything we do is in the name of that. And, you know, these Adult Swim kind of shows, you know, are just a, another, like, level of the thing we want to do. We always want to make video work on that level. And even if every television network in the United States were like, we never want to see your faces in here again, like, we would still keep making this stuff and still be happy about it, you know? We can make things for no money. We can. We can keep pushing our humor. Like, there's nothing, it's not gonna slow us down, you know? Um, so that's like, I feel like that attitude and that position has been something that we've worked and takes a long time to cultivate. Like, you have to cultivate that attitude and that place in your life where you're like, okay, everything could fall apart, and then what would I do? Well, what wouldn't I do? I'd do, I'd do comedy, like, you can't take that away from me.